The Small Business Show, episode 192 for Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Small Business Show here at businessshow.co, the show by, for, and about small business owners. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And out on the West Coast, I'm Shannon Jean, BFA, man. I'm BFA? excited to be here talking about, uh, by, for, and about small business. By, for, and about small business. Speaking of about, Shannon, we have a guest with us today, don't we? We do, yeah. You know, uh, we talk on the show a lot about, uh, you know, turning your hobby into a small business, uh, pros and cons, all that kind of stuff, trying to keep the joy that you've got for what you really love as you start your business. Today, we're joined by a small business owner who turned his hobby into a business, uh, started brewing cider in his garage and turned it into Santa Barbara Cider Company, moved in from his garage to eventually opening up a tap room down in Santa Barbara, California. Uh Thanks for joining us today, Ben. We appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, let's talk for a few minutes about how you got started. You know, I always hear about guys brewing beer as a popular hobby, but, you know, uh, and you might might have done that as well. But you, you know, eventually wound up with cider. How'd you how'd you get down that path and how'd you take that big, you know, leap from your garage to, uh, you know, your commercial space you're in now? Sure. Yeah, actually, I, I, I hate to sound so unoriginal, but I actually did start with beer. So <laughs> I, uh, I was doing uh, homebrew and I'm kind of a, a craft beer fanatic. So I'd head up to Northern California for like the Pliny the Younger release for Russian River, or I'd nice. go check out Rare Barrel in Berkeley. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I really just enjoy the craft beer scene and I was making beer with some friends and we were having a good time with it. And, uh, you know, uh, the, where I, where I made a turn on that pathway was, uh, I have a, a daughter who has celiac disease, so she is uh, gluten-free and not that my 12 year old drinks, but, um, that, uh, we ended up hanging out with uh, more people that, uh, have that same kind of thing. So we ended up, you know, I started making gluten-free beer and then, you know, we'd, we'd sit around with our friends and we'd be talking about it. And somebody mentioned cider and I, it kind of interested me. And so I made what I like to describe as years and years of really bad cider. And that ended up turning into, uh, some decent stuff. And so, you know, I, I started, I'd be taking my, uh, my cider over to my neighbor's house. And at one point he looks at me and he goes, Oh, this is great. Where'd you buy it from? And uh-huh. I was like, no, no, I made it in the garage. <laughs> right. So, uh, then that turned into somebody else hearing about it and, Hey, can you help me make this for a wedding? And so we, you know, it it just kind of snowballed from there. And then, um, yeah, the, the leap actually came from, you know, I, I run another company out of the same warehouse. Uh, and I was finding that over time I didn't need to carry as much stuff. So I was, uh, I was doing some e-commerce and some shipping, of, uh, you know, merchandise. And I found that as you know, I needed less and less of that space. I was looking at it going, what am I going to do with this space? So I've got this hobby I'm really enjoying. Uh, so, you know, I, I ended up really taking a good, hard, long look at it. I think I probably spent a couple of years going, okay, if I did this and then what if I put this thing here and what would that, would that even make sense? And so eventually I ended up, uh, feeling confident enough about it that I'd ended up pulling in two partners. I talked with my sister and uh, a good friend of mine of over 20 years. And we, uh, we all kind of partnered up, had our own strengths and and we ended up going for it. So it took a a while to open up, but we're having fun. So that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was a couple of years that you were making the cider in your garage, kind of perfecting things before you uh, launched, you know, opened the tap room. I would like to be able to tell you that I picked it up that quickly, but oh, it took a lot longer. So really, you know how some people are classically trained on the piano and they've got a method that they learned by, and then some people just pound out stuff on the piano until they finally go, wait a minute. Okay. This will sound better. And this will sound better. And and so over time, uh, you know, utilizing a lot of the, the homebrew uh, technique that we were working with, uh, I ended up shaping the flavors and what I was looking for. And there's, you know, cider is one of those things where it, you know, there's enough information where you can probably get pushed in the right direction, but you could also definitely, you know, 
get bad information too. So, um, ended up kind of taking some left turns as we went and just made our way to, to where we're at and then finally got comfortable with technique and here we are. So huh. I want to say it probably took about seven, eight years before I felt comfortable with it. Wow. At, at, at what point did you know that you were working towards something that was potentially or likely even going to be a business as opposed to, Hey, you know, I've got my other businesses, you know, I'll, I'll classify that as day job, even though that, that, you know, that can mean a different thing. Right. But you had Mm -hmm. income going, you didn't need to start a cash cow right away or anything, you know? So I'm just curious at what point you thought, Hey, wait a minute, like this could be the next thing or another thing. You know, that's a, (laughs) that's a really interesting question. Cause I think that, you know, a lot of times people go, man, all the courage. And I, I feel like I, I took so many small steps that along the way that I, I always was trying to look at it through the lens of, okay, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. Um, I think that's probably the biggest danger people face uh, when you're running a business is you look at it and you're like, I can take over the world. And they just, you know, they try and run before they crawl and et cetera, et cetera. And so the original plan was, you know, I, I enjoy doing this so much. And I'm, I'm inviting people over to try cider at the house. And what do you think? And it, we pair it with this food and we, we can add this thing or you can blend the different ciders together. And what do you, you know, I, I started going down that road and I looked at the, the space we had and I went, you know, if I open it up just enough so that it can produce some income and I'm really careful about not spending money. Cause you know, there's only two things you can control in terms of, uh, you know, a profit margin, you know, you're either selling more stuff or you're not spending money while you're doing it. Yeah. And, um, so just a real slow process of, okay, uh, I'm enjoying doing this. How many hours would I want to be doing this if I really was going to do this full time? And so we, we just picked a couple hours on a Thursday, a Friday and a Saturday, um, and really just set expectations really low, wanted to spend just enough money to get open and create a nice experience for people. And to me, I was, like I said, I, I would go and I'd, I'd be talking with the craft brewery down the street going, what do you guys think of this? How'd you come up with your names? Why did you, why do you have a TV in here? Why do you not? What, what, why do you have games outside? What's the, what's the thought process here? And, um, you know, I, I wanted to recreate that kind of an experience at a place where we can invite our friends and family to and, you know, it's it, one of the things I enjoy about it. It's not even necessarily the, the cider, but it, that it brings people together. You know, if you look at marketing for, for example, like wine, wine's kind of a romantic, you know, villas and vineyards and, yeah. you know, there's, there's images that come up, but when you think of beer, uh, the, the, the message and the imaging tends to be more of a, you know, sit down with your buddies and grab a drink. And then sure. you have craft, which is more specific and, just higher quality and really fresh. And the place we're at in Santa Barbara, what I enjoy about it is it's a very local supporting kind of place. And so we wanted to have a local place to just kind of hang out and enjoy what we were doing and create some community. And so uh, we looked at it and just started with three days a week, a couple hours here, a couple hours there. And um, the advantage we had was that we had another business running out of there. And that was really the most expensive part of the overhead was, um, you know, trying to account for, you know, rent or whatever it may end up being rent to yourself in in this case. Is that right? Yeah. So, and that, that, that was also part of the consideration when we looked at, um, you know, as everybody's putting in, you know, resources, time, money, you know, we looked at it and we went, okay, let's, let's see what, what kind of rent do we need to provide? Um, or can we cover or, you know, what can be chipped in in the meantime, because when you're building out a business, that's one of the more expensive things is that build out and the, that permitting, especially with alcohol. It was, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. it's a long process. So having the, uh, having the rent covered essentially during that process was, was key to what we were doing. So, so uh, on your, you mentioned your other, your other company, uh, c- can you share what that, what, what you guys do there and how, uh, I would imagine that experience helped you, you know, to get, the cider business off the ground, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, welcome down the rabbit hole. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, the company I have is a marching band supply company. 
Oh, and it's a niche. Yeah. I was, yeah, was going to say, you probably hear it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you are the fourth person this month. Yes, Nona. <laughs> I bet, right? And uh, so it's a really niche business, very seasonal, mm. uh, very relationship driven. And uh, I really enjoy it. It's another one of those things that I just really enjoy doing. And so um, it, it was based out of a warehouse. And we were uh, do, doing a lot of orders via e-commerce and phone. And uh, because of the seasonality of it, I had time during the year where I knew I had a downtime and a busy time and I could kind of schedule around that. Mm-hmm. And so as we built that out, we were looking at, okay, well, does this fit into the rest of the schedule and trying to raise a family and the whole bit and trying to balance all those things in unison. And so it's been a, it's been a, cu- a really uh, busy couple of years, if you can imagine. So, yeah, I'm sure. So, mm-hmm. and you mentioned uh, like regulatory hurdles and that kind of thing, because with alcohol, uh, t- talk talk about that for a moment, if you will, and and how you navigated through those you know barriers. I'm I'm also interested to know. I mean, were you selling the cider before you opened up the tap room? Uh, you know, give us a little background on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so selling alcohol is actually hyper-regulated. And it's one of those things where if you're producing it for your own personal consumption, you can only make 100 gallons a year. Only. Oh. Only. Huh. And um, so it's one of those things where if you're going to do a permit, the permitting process is designed to start with your neighbors. And so you have to start going around and talk to your neighbors. Are the neighbors okay with this? Is this going to work? Um, so I went to all the other businesses in the area and we chatted it out and I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I not interrupt their business and be a good neighbor while I'm doing this? Did you bring them and cider they, while you were asking? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it would have been malpractice if I didn't. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, uh, yeah, well, it, 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 I, Hey, you guys, I need some, uh, I need some help. Can you, can you give me some feedback on this? Oh, this is great. You know, it's funny you say that I was thinking about opening a cider place here. What do you wow. think? And so, uh, they're like, that's great. They, and everyone was really super supportive. You know, that's, nice. that's one of the things I've enjoyed about, uh, being a small business owner is that, you know, other small business owners kind of get it and they're supportive and, that's one of the nice things about the area that we started the business in. And I, I, it made, it gave me comfort to know that it's a local supported place and they, you know, everyone's been super supportive and, you know, then it's up to us to deliver, but, um, well, you, you know, so you start, you mm-hmm. did something though, I, you know, I, and, and I think, you know, you did this, but, but for anyone listening, we sort of just glossed over it. You, you started with, Hey, I need some help. People Mm -hmm. love to help people. We all do. Right. I mean, it's it's not just all all of them over there. We're like, we're all humans. We love to help each other if it's the right scenario. And you can paint that scenario when you walk in the door and you say, hey, I need some help. It shows a little humility. It shows that you are willing to receive help. Right. That someone's help Mm -hmm. isn't going to fall on deaf ears. And and that's a really smart way, especially in a scenario like you were, where you had to get permits and and, and you had to get your neighbors to not block these permits. That's mm-hmm. that's a huge thing. It's a great way to start. So, folks, I just want to make sure you don't miss that one. So, yep. yeah, it, no, it's very cool. Please and uh, please and thank you went a long way, too. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, you, you know, the, the permitting process, you start with your neighbors and then you go to the city. So you have these concentric circles that get bigger and bigger. And then if the city goes, well, are your neighbors OK with it? And you post a sign and that's their way of making sure the neighbors are OK with it. And then after that, you, you know, you get the approval from the state and the state will ask the city. And then the, <laughs> then you get the federal. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then the federal asks the state who then asks the city. So it, it all comes down to are your neighbors comfortable with what you're doing? And it's, it's a process of trying to work your way through that. And that process generally takes anywhere from nine months to a year to walk through if everything's going right. And the challenge with that is that you can't sell anything during that time frame. So that's kind of a barrier to entry for most um, mm. of that scenario is you got to pick a space, you got to commit to it. And then you got to walk through that nine month to 12 month process of what, you know, of getting it all approved while right. you, you then run the risk of at any point along the way, somebody saying, no, no, we're not good. So, um, so if you start with, you know, being a good neighbor 
and asking for help and a little please and thank you and um, making sure that everybody in your neighborhood gets invited to things. It, it ends up working out really well and everyone's been really happy. So yeah. really cool. Are, are you guys and now are you selling, you know, exclusively in the tap room or you do you distribute to other, you know, restaurants, bars, liquor stores or anything like that? Great question. We're actually originally I opened it up with the expectation that maybe 10 people a week would come by and be like, oh, hey, what's happening? <laughs> and, you know, uh, pretty quickly we ended up, you know, we only opened up like a 600 square foot tasting area and people were kind of outside of that. And we had to keep corralling people back in. This is our controlled area, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had to quickly expand to the outside area. And so we're at about 1,800 square feet, mostly outdoor space. Um, We've got a good amount of regular people coming through and uh, some new people finding us in the area as as it's kind of a, a vacation spot. And what we're finding is that we originally were going to be just in the tasting room but based on there not being that many places out there like it, and I think we offer a, a, a fun experience, we've started having restaurants and bars in the area coming in and going, hey, how come you haven't offered to sell me your stuff? And I, well, that's, I, 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 I don't think we can even produce that much. <laughs> uh, nice. So then we've, we've you know, that slow, uh, really conservative kind of approach to growth has been, uh, okay, we can add one or two accounts. And so we went to, um, let's see, we're at the Santa Barbara bowl, which is the local, uh, concert place. We're at, uh, one of my favorite pizza places where I went to when I was in college called Woodstocks. And we're at a, a couple of key accounts like that in town, but we're, at, we've, we've now reached this saturation point between our, our ability to supply and, uh, the demand that we get that, we're now trying to figure out, okay, we've kind of reached this plateau. Now we need to kind of take another level of risk. And so I've been, I've been doing a deep dive over the last six months to try and figure out, okay, I've now reached the outer boundaries of the experience that I have in this industry. And so I've been reaching out to other people that run breweries and wineries. And I've talked to my attorney and a number of CPAs and, they've directed me to people who have had other multiple businesses in town. And and I've been, I've been really fortunate to be able to pull off of their experience. And, you know, I I already had a decent amount of, of owning my own business experience, but as I've gotten to this point and as I reach out to people for advice and help, um, I'm finding there's, there's a, a, there's a genuine, uh, want to help. Like you had mentioned before, um, they then reach into their network and then pull out people that they have that I wouldn't have thought of or have been connected to. And so I've been able to talk to some really interesting people in town, um, and people who are really encouraging oh, wow. people who've owned a number of, uh, multiple businesses or, uh, you know, it was just, and I've gotten a couple pieces of advice that I, I, I wouldn't have thought of that have been really key in the decision-making process as we move forward. So that's, that's great. kind of leads towards that. That's cool. Yeah, we talk on the show a lot about uh, kind of building out your your board of advisors, your board of directors, mm-hmm. if you will. It sounds like you've really taken that to heart. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's killer. All right, Ben and Shannon, I want to take, and everyone listening, actually, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor today, which is Text Expander. We're at textexpander.com slash podcast. You get 20% off your first year of this indispensable tool man if there's one thing that i have on my mac and on my iphone that i don't want to live without especially when it comes to dealing with stuff for business it's text expander now here's the thing right we talk about this i'm going to show you a different light on it you know because you've been listening that text expander lets you create snippets right where you have some text that you want to type and then You put that in and you have a little shortcut that triggers that, right? And that makes sense on your Mac, right? Sure. You know, you don't want to have to type out big, long things. But how about when you're on your phone and you get one of those emails that you say, man, I need to wait until I get back to my computer to reply to this because I don't want to screw up the, you know, the formatting of this email, even though It's something you answer all the time. Well, guess what? You can have Text Expander on your phone. 
It can be available right inside the normal mail client or any mail client that you use because Text Expander can act as a special keyboard right on your iPhone. So you can do all these great things. You can have it do your customer service replies. You can have like sales replies. I've got some in there where people say, I want this. And boom, I type like eight characters and they get this whole email that explains it. And it's been perfectly honed because we've iterated on it and we can share it as a team. Awesome, awesome stuff. You got to check it out. Go to textexpander.com slash podcast. You get 20% off your first year. Our sincere thanks to Text Expander and the folks at Smile for not only sponsoring the show, but also for doing what they do. Our second sponsor for this episode is Gusto. Payroll and benefits are hard, especially for us small business owners, right? You don't have time to be an expert in things like taxes and regulations. And old school payroll providers just aren't built for the way that you work today. You want to use your phone. You want to use your computer. You want to use technology. And that's what Gusto is built on. Gusto makes payroll benefits and HR easy for small businesses because they let modern technology do all the heavy lifting. So it's super easy for you to get things right. Most small businesses, you don't have an HR expert on staff for you, do you? No, but you don't need one to use Gusto. With great software and great service, you can focus on your business, not on payroll and paperwork. You no longer have to be a big company to get great tech, great benefits, and great service for your team. So check it out. To help support the show, Gusto is offering you, our listeners, an exclusive limited time deal. Sign up today and you'll get three months for free once you run your first payroll. That's three months free once you run your first payroll. The way you do it, how? You remember, go to gusto.com slash SBS. That's gusto.com slash SBS. That's where you're going to get three months free when, once you run your first payroll from Gusto. Our sincere thanks to Gusto for sponsoring this episode. All right, Shannon, what do you got next for Ben? So, Ben, you guys have a, a ton of great reviews out there. When I looked around on Google, Facebook, Yelp, and other sites, do you focus on growing those reviews to help your business, or do you just let it grow you know, organically? You know, that's a really great question. We talk about it a lot. Uh, we talk about it a lot. And uh, we've got some really great uh, people doing their social media. Uh, I would say that our social media is uh, on point. Uh, and for anybody who's interested in, in knowing my wife does help with that. So she's amazing. Cause I know she'll listen to this, um, uh, that, and, you know, we look at social media in general as the number one way people are going to find you anyway. So we're tucked back off of the street and we're really hard to find. So the only way you're going to find us is if you're looking for an experience or something to do. And so we know that those reviews are really, really important and they do matter. And, and the way we looked at it and consistently approached it has been, we don't really ask for reviews, um, but we look at it as a way to have a conversation and get that direct feedback. So what we're considering those reviews is really kind of a, a, an update or an, uh, on like a, a live update in terms of a conversation with our customers. So our focus has been on really providing an outstanding experience, high fives for people when they come in, whether it's their first time or their, you know, 20th time, it's good to see you again, or congratulations on finding us. How'd you find us? Let me tell you a little bit about the, the stuff that we're doing here. And, you know, we're just so happy that you're here and we try and get to know everybody by name. So, that's you know, great. that's, that's really what we're focusing on. And, and I think that's what online reviews really are is just, that's where people are. They're on their phones and yeah, they want to connect sure. on it. And, so we hear a lot of, you know, we found you on this app or that app. So That's great. So, so focusing so on the, go ahead. I was going to say that to, to sort of encapsulate that the, the best way to be good on social media is to simply be social when you're in person too. Right. I mean, that's the, yeah. at least that's where it begins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it starts, um, it starts with the actual experience when you come in. So it, we, we want to make sure it's relational and not transactional. Uh, we want people to have a good time. We want them to connect. And then we're, we're there on social media and on these apps so that when people are, um, uh, 
are there and they are communicating that way that we're able to respond to it. And that that's really where it's at. So we also tell people, you know, find us on social media, find us on Instagram. If you want, we've got events and some other things happening and, and then we have to deliver on that. Yeah. That's and that's great. the, that's the communication uh, tool that we use right now. That's cool. So, uh, on this show, we're big fans of mistakes and in the sense that, uh, we all learn so much from them. And I, we ask this for every guest that comes on the show, what's been the best mistake you think you've made with, uh, you know, Santa Barbara cider that you've learned the most from? Oh man. You know, I, I think, you know, when, when you talk about mistakes, uh, really what that, that translates into later is experience. And, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have some really good business mentors over time where, you know, it, every time we have a meeting, you know, the question is, um, you know, all right, everybody check in, let's hear how you're doing, what's going on, where are you at? Just so everyone kind of has an idea, uh, very quickly. And then after that, we talk about what mistakes did you make this week so that we can all learn from it. And the idea is to not shy away from learning from something. So we've had our successes. We've been really lucky with those. Um, I, not that I think that we're flawless and that we can't improve, but I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have made enough mistakes in some of my other, uh, experiences that, um, you know, I think it tempered some of our expectations heading into what we're doing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity where we could have rushed uh, too far in or, you know, um, gotten ourselves caught up in, uh, you know, you know, let's invest in this now, or let's, let's do this other thing. And, uh, so far we've been chugging along pretty decently, um, that I feel really good about, but I don't want to say that's because we're super smart or anything. It's that, um, we've made enough mistakes or I've made enough mistakes personally over the years to have learned enough to just temper expectations consistently go through things. And I think when you look at mistakes in general, they only come from three things. And the first one is if you're rushing, the second one is if you're trying to do too much. And the third one is if you're just completely distracted by something else and, and usually mistakes fall into those three categories. So, um, whenever we're doing something that's of high importance, it's let's move slow because we just want to do it once instead of having to come back and do it again. Um, you know, we've had stuff where we've had some failures of equipment, but that it's just a thing that happens and you move on from it. But, um, you know, the, as far as mistakes, we haven't, you know, like I said, I, I don't think we're flawless and, and yeah, right. we're definitely going to improve, but you know, we're, we've tempered our expectations and we've just, we've moved slow through the process. So that's great. That's awesome. Well, it's a great story. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love the, you know, this, this methodical, uh, conservative growth and continuing to make decisions along the way. I think that's really valuable. So w- what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about uh, Santa Barbara Cider? That's a great question. So I would actually look us up on Instagram. We always have some information there. We've got our website, sbcider.com, which we're going to be redoing shortly. Um, and actually really the best way to learn more about us and to, to really get the experience is to come see us in person. You know, I'd, I will, uh, you know, if, if someone wants to come in and uh, wants to chat and they want to kind of just set the time aside, I'm happy to do that. That's that's my jam right there. And, um, you know, I, you know, come on in. And part of what we do is we've got, as an example, we have 65 flavors, but we Whoa. have 12 on tap. Yeah. Right. Well, we have 12 on tap at a time. So every time you come in, it's a little different. Um, and so sometimes you'll come in and there'll be pineapple habanero on on tap or We've got a peanut butter and jelly flavor, which is a grape cider with honey and peanut butter powder on the rim. So it tastes like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We've got uh, pineapple. We have uh, apple pie. We've got uh, honey crisp. We have mango. We've got pineapple guava. We, uh-huh. You name it. So we've got some fun stuff. We have hop cider. So every time you come through, it's just a little bit different. And we're always having fun with the, uh, the names, too. So Awesome. That's great. Well, we really appreciate you ha- coming here and telling your story and, and sharing. And uh, next time we're down in the area, I'll definitely stop by and yeah. uh, have a drink, man. <laughs> Sounds great. 
I love it. Cheers. So good. Yeah, thanks cheers for thanks for joining us. And uh, folks, we'll see you next week. Make sure to find us at businessshow.co and our small business support group, of course, businessshow.co slash Facebook. Keep living that charmed life. We'll see you next week. Peace.